What up guys, Jason Guyman here with PressureWashHelp.com and today I got an awesome topic that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is a topic that is probably one of the most questions that I get I'll ask a lot and I don't always know the answer but today I got a special guy on named Matt and he will be on here shortly and I will tell you about insurance. So, but before I get there, I wanted just to mention that I wanted to let you know that tonight or tomorrow night, Monday night, is the end of a few things. It is the end of the $49 thing of my training. So go check out pressurewashhelp.com slash training. And in there, you will find um, some things. So my prices are going up tomorrow. It will be the $49 is gone. So go check that out. And there you will find it. Um, so tonight I have on Matt Zinzer, and he it does insurance. And so this is a question that I get asked a lot. And so Matt, tell me a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So how's it going, guys? Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, this is definitely an industry that one of my best friend works in. I've actually done some jobs with him, but. Um, you know, I've been in the insurance industry for the last uh, 16 years, now eh, 15 and a half. Um, spent a lot of time on the uh, kind of the, you know, working directly with the insurance company. And I've spent about half my career as an agent. And then within the last year, I opened up my own agency. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with you know, a lot of the stuff on the personal lines and the commercial lines. Um, you know, I've got good experience on the, you know, industry side, kind of knowing the ins and outs of claims, service, uh, kind of everything inside the actual insurance company. But then also from the other side of the desk, from the agent's perspective, working directly with the clients. So, you know, I've got I've got good a good background on both sides. And, you know, my favorite thing is working with, uh, you know, folks like, you know, a good friend of mine, Ben Gregory. You know, he's got a great business here in northern Kentucky. And. You know, I've, I think that was probably my first one that I kind of really dove into pressure washers, understanding coverages and, you know, gaps and potential areas of concern. And so I really, you know, kind of jumped in feet first with the uh, pressure washers trying to understand, you know, exactly the needs in that industry and the kind of stuff that folks need for coverage. All right. So, guys, this is how it's going to work. I have a whole list of questions here that I'm going to kind of go down. Um, if you have a question, we will take them at the end. Um, so you might want to hold it to the end or you can actually type it there and I'll, I'll scroll back through if I find it. Or I'll jot it down here. So um, so my first question is, is to Matt is when do I need to get insurance? Do I need to get it right away? Can I wait a month? When do I need to get insurance for my pressure washing business? Um, I mean, that's a good question. I you know, technically, I'm not going to tell everybody they're required to have it. You can go do a job and not have it. Um, the risk that you run is if something happens, you know, liability-wise, um, if you don't have insurance, somebody can come after you personally. You know, I think one of the things you probably have discussed at some point is setting up an LLC or something like that, you know, to protect the business entity and yourself individually. So, you know, the importance of having a, a commercial insurance policy is it separates you personally um, from any kind of liability where if you're out doing a job, you know, something happens to the customer's house or property um, or one of your employees, if you have somebody out there helping, um, it's critically important that you're not tied to that, but it's the actual business, um, you know, that would carry that liability. Because personally, you can't get a policy, you know, on your homeowners or your auto policy or anything like that to cover the business that you're doing, the work that you're doing. Um, so if something were to happen, you know, my brother started out with landscaping and lawn care and that kind of stuff. And, you know, he, for the longest time, he didn't carry liability insurance uh, for his business. And I eventually, told, you know, convinced him, like, you know, bro, <laughs> you're, you're putting yourself at a major risk here that, you know, if something happens, like your business is gone, like you can't do anything. And furthermore, it's going to come back on you personally, where 
you know, they're not, if you damage their home $100,000, they're not just going to say, well, he doesn't have insurance, so I guess we don't get anything. No, they'll come after you, anything you own. Uh, it's, and I don't mean to, you know, say that to be, you know, Debbie Downer or Doomsday, but it's critically important that, you know, you do have uh, the proper insurance coverage and most importantly that it's done correctly. One of the biggest things I see all the time is just, you know, policies that just, they don't have the right coverage. They're not cover, covering the right class of business. And that's a good question because that is my next question. How do I know if I'm proper, how do I know if I am properly covered in the right category? So the NAICS code, you know, if you were to look that up is, let's see, I wrote it down, 561790. That's the NAICS like insurance code that, would cover um, exterior cleaning, whether it's driveways, houses, um, anything. It's just, you know, cleaning services. Um, that's the proper code classification. Um, when you're working with an agent, it's important to, you know, look at your policy. Don't just say, I do this, you know, I clean houses. A lot of times what they do is they list you as a janitor. I see that 90% of the time where they say you do janitorial services. Once you actually look at that policy, most of the coverage in there is for interior cleaning. So it doesn't really cover any roof work. It doesn't cover cleaning a driveway. Um, so a lot of that stuff is, you know, it's coverage for something that you could prove you have insurance. But, you know, I told like, I'll, I'll use Ben as my reference. You know, I told him early on he had a policy that he was listed as a janitor. And he's and, on here tonight, too. He's he's already, yeah, yeah. He's already been commenting, so. All right. So, so you know, if something happened for, you know, like, let's say he damaged the driveway or damaged the roof or something happened and the customer, you know, got upset and they wanted to file a claim against Ben and his business, there's, it's very highly likely that his insurance would have denied that claim. You know, insurance companies, they go by the book when it comes to coverage and what they're going to pay out. You know, they're, they're obviously, they're willing to pay claims for which they have received the money to cover the claim, but they're not going to cover something that, you know, you haven't actually paid the premium to cover that risk. Gotcha. So if you're not covered for, you know, some, some work that you're doing, they're going to deny it all day. Yeah, um, Benjamin Baker just put, um, I had the same issue with, a, I had Hiscott Insurance had them for a year before I found out it was only covering the inside cleaning. Like, what the hell? I couldn't believe it. So, mm -hmm. um, here's a question that um, is a pretty decent question because this might help for discounts. Um, Impact Safety put it, Matt, have you seen any commercial discounts given for a company having a comprehensive safety program? And if so, what elements needed to be in place? Yeah, so there are just about every company out there. Sorry, I got to turn this phone off. Um, most companies, they're going to have, you know, I'll give you a kind of a, a peek behind the curtain. Uh, most companies will have different debits and stuff that they can utilize based on safety programs, based on, you know, how, how long you've been in business. Um, commercial isn't like personal lines insurance. You know, with personal lines, you call in, you have a home, you have an auto, you give them your driver's license, give them your personal information. They quote you with a bunch of different companies. Here's your rate. Um, on commercial side, there's a lot of different factors that can be adjusted. So, you know, if you have, you know, an OSHA program, you're checking, you know, you're doing uh, drug screens for, you know, people that are driving vehicles, you're, you know, doing different tests and stuff to ensure safety. You have a written uh, safety manual, you know, that everybody has to read and sign. All of those things are helpful, you know, to me as an agent, when I want to go to a certain carrier and say, hey, I'd like to get another 10% off for these guys. You know, they've got a great business. They've, you know, they've got a great program in place to make sure things are safe. Um, and it's easier for me to get, you know, additional discounts if I can provide information that shows you have these measures in place. 
So what he Impact Safety actually does is he's actually starting a business um, of kind of teaching safety and that kind of thing. So um, his his job his full time job is a safety officer kind of for the company and training and and so you know safety is a huge thing and I would figure that would be helpful and I know especially if you have um, workers comp and it will definitely probably help you with the workers comp side of side of things too I would assume. Yep. All right. So my next question is, is um, it, um, how much do I need? Do I need 250000 million? How much do I need? Um, I mean, I always tell people you can never have too much insurance because, you know, it's you want it there for when it hits the fan. And, you know, it's people these days are, you know, they're litigation so happy. You know, everybody's trying to get money. If, you know, something happens, they want the most money they can possibly squeeze out of somebody. So I don't personally, I don't really ever do anything under like a million dollars liability with a two million aggregate. Reason being, the cost difference is so minor from like 250000 to 500000 up to a million on liability where you're really going to pay, you know, the premiums is when it comes to your equipment, um, your, you know, your revenue, like all these other factors. It's actually not the liability coverage that costs you on premium. Um, so you could do, for example, a $500,000 general liability policy for 700 bucks, hypothetically. You could do a million dollars coverage for like $750. So, so I don't even bother offering the lower coverage because so tell, let's I don't, just why would I do that? Let's just keep it simple because we've got stupid people here like myself. Well, tell me what is the million dollar coverage with the $2 million aggregate? So you've got a million dollars per you know incident up to a $2 million annual aggregate limit. So, you know, essentially if you have, you know, this one single event, and that's the only thing that happens the whole that has happened in the last year. You would have up to that annual aggregate of two million. Um, but if you had something else that happened in January that ate up a million dollars of that, you had something that happened today, you would have that other million for your annual aggregate. Okay. Does that make sense? It does. I just wanted to clarify it because I mean I, I knew that, but I wanted to I like yeah. to I like the Barney style it as some of the guys that have been make fun of me, but I want to bring it down to the simplest level. Because hey. insurance yeah, is one of those things that you really do need to be covered. You know, if you yeah. own anything or if you you know, it, it it really covers your back is what it does, you know. And you know, it's just like having car insurance. You know, you may never use it your whole life, but when you do, you better have it. So well, I always tell people I insure about everything that I own, you know, TVs, washer, dryer, obviously cars, everything else. Most of that stuff I've never used insurance on. But, you know, I did flood my kitchen one time replacing the faucet and it was a $10,000, $12,000 claim. Yep. So it's, you know, you never know which one of those insurance coverages you're going to need, but it's there, you know, for those holy crap moments where you know you're going to need it. All right. So this was a question I asked you before on, it's a little bit down the list, but somebody did ask it and he put, um, um, well, my question was, do we need to be bonded? But he put, do you do bonds too? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, bonds are there. I don't really see, I mean, I don't know how many people in this industry are getting asked for bonds. Essentially, what you're doing is you're going to a third party, typically it's the state, and they're holding, you know, a set amount of funds. So maybe it's, you know, $10,000. And you have a customer that says, hey, we want to see that you have a bond in place. And what's the purpose of the bond? I always thought it was for like if you're going inside and stuff, but that's just I don't know what it, what is the purpose of a bond. It's basically it's guaranteeing your work. So, you know, the customer wants to know that if you come out and, you know, do a job and they paid you $5,000 to do the job and what you did was, you know, clean half of the property, which was $2,500, well, the bond, that 
the insurer is going to take that bond and go to the state where you have your money set aside in that bond and they're going to get their $2,500 back or they're going to use that money to bring somebody else out to finish the job. So bonding, so, basic, so bonding basically means that it's going to get the job done, correct? Yeah. And it's, it's not something you see a whole lot of. It's, you know, typically it's on really, really high value jobs that, you know, somebody wants to see that you have the financial support to guarantee that, you know, you're not going to short them on a job that you have, you know, the money if you don't finish it or you don't complete the work that they're going to either get their money back or they're going to get somebody else to come in and finish the job at your expense. See, I had no clue about that. I thought it was something like if you went in and stole something or, you know, inside, because <laughs> that's what I'd always heard. It's only you only really need it if you were inside. So, yeah, and that's that's where you know, that's where some of the other coverages are, like on your general liability policy, as far as, you know, one of your employees steal something or whatever. But the bond is specifically like a third party that's holding X amount of dollars that if you don't finish a job or you don't complete something, your customer gets reimbursed or they get to use that money to finish the job. Is it expensive to get bonded or not really? No, I mean, bonds aren't that bad because most of the cost is obviously you taking some of your assets and setting it into a third party account gotcha. um, to be able to get that bond issue. Gotcha. Hey, that's good information. I mean, so if, even if you would get bonded, that is something you could use for your business to say, hey, I'm bonded and this is probably none of my other competitors are. And this is what it means. If I do this thousand dollar job and I don't do it properly, I wouldn't tell them too many because you might get a jack leg. But if they don't, you know, it yeah. just sounds good if nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. You can put any amount in a bond, you know, get a bond and throw it out there and say that you have a bond that. You know, it gives people peace of mind if they know what a bond is. Right, right. You know, and typically, like I said, it's going to be for your higher value customers, you know, the higher value jobs where they're really looking for that kind of stuff. Gotcha. So what are some common mistakes people make when getting insurance? Um, the biggest thing is looking for the cheapest thing you can find. And, you pay for uh, what you get. Yeah. And... And I, I totally get it. You know, I'm, I'm all about making sure you've got the best price out there. And, you know, my biggest thing, I've looked at some, you know, policies where I'm like, I can't beat the rate and you've got a great product. You need to stay where you're at. Um, but at the same time, I really go through each policy with a fine tooth comb and make sure I'm looking at the coverages and making sure that stuff's in there that you actually need. Um, you know, cyber coverage, which, you know, we can talk about that if you want to, but there's different things that, you know, a lot of people, they just say, hey, I've got a pressure washing business. I need to get insurance. You know, I need to get liability insurance. Well, yeah, you need, you might need that to do a job, but the big thing is what you've invested into this business. You know, I, you know, at least every year I talk to Ben and I'm like, you know, what kind of equipment do you have? What kind of stuff? You know, have you added so that I can make sure this gets scheduled so that if something happens to it, it's stolen or it's, you know. Do we need to, what's, what are some things, um, what are some things that we need to do to, um, like, make sure if we do add stuff that you may need to do or, or some things that we can do is, like, take a picture of it, take a picture of the VIN number, all that kind of stuff? Or what are some things that we, or maybe go around the whole trailer and kind of videotape everything and that way you know what you have? Yeah, I mean, videotapes are always good, but, you know, if you've got receipts of stuff you've purchased that's, you know, date stamped um, and it's got the, you know, the make and the model on there, that's usually like what I ask them for is, hey, you know, what did you get? You know, what's the, you know, maybe it has a serial number or just give me the make and the model. I can Google it to see kind of what it would cost. Um, but that way, you know, you have those specific items scheduled. And, you know, you really want to make sure you have the higher value stuff scheduled um, so that if something happened to that individual item, you have that full amount covered. I also, you know, you want to make sure you have a total limit because you have other tools. Right. You know, you have different, you might have $100 worth of, you know, nozzles and, you know, 
$300 worth of hoses and all this other stuff. And, you know, I put those on a blanket limit. So I generally do like a blanket coverage for all the stuff that's under like 500 bucks. And then you really want to do scheduled stuff for your higher ticket items. You know, the stuff that's going to be 500, a thousand, a couple thousand dollars. You want to have those specifically identified. Gotcha. 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 Um, Impact had just wanted to say to clarify a hundred thousand dollar bond requires a hundred thousand of assets to be aside question mark yeah so if you wanted a hundred thousand dollar bond you're essentially giving a third party a hundred thousand dollars so that you could go and do a job or you know bid a job and say you're bonded for a hundred thousand dollars so you have those assets set aside to a third party gotcha gotcha if that answers that question yep that does um, so, um, what, uh, so what states do you cover and how can you help other people? Um, so right now I cover Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee. Um, I do have West Virginia, but there's not a lot of good carriers in West Virginia, um, you know, that do pressure washing. There are some, they're just not that good. Um, but I'm open, you know, even if I'm not, you know, in a state, I'm working on getting a national program in place where I can cover pressure washers around the country. But even if I'm not in a state, you know, I am absolutely happy to talk to you to make sure you get something. If you get a quote back, I'm happy to look at it and tell you, hey, ask them about this or make sure you get this coverage. You know, I can help you make sure you get, you know, the proper coverage. It's not about me. You know, obviously I'm in a business. I've got my own business and I'm trying to make money too. But, you know, I'm, I'm invested in the pressure washing industry. You know, one of my best friends is in it and I'm, you know, I want to see him succeed and I want to make sure other guys out there in the same industry are, you know, getting the proper coverage. I don't want to see you guys go under because you don't have insurance. That's so, the last thing I want to see happen. And because and, you're getting some questions of different states. So if you are in a different state, you may reach out to him. You can go to pressurewashhelp.com slash insurance. You'll see the link down here and that will send him that information to Matt. And that way he can, you know, help you out or he might be able to send you to a person that he can actually refer you to. So that way um, you, you won't be just going to anybody at that point. He can, he's got contacts across the country that he can refer you to somebody. Sound about right. <laughs> got it. Um, this was a question that I don't know. Let me see here. Where was it at? Um, I got more questions over there, but I've seen this one from, um, one of them. It was about fire, um, terrorism, terrorism, fire. Where would that question go at? Um, what is terrorism fire following premium? What is it? Terrorism, terrorism, fire, fire following premium. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what that is. Well, typically you have terrorism coverage that you can include or exclude from a policy. Um, so if, if there's something that happens, you know, that you have damage to your equipment or your, you know, business property as a result of an act of terrorism, you can include that as coverage or you can exclude that and save money. I've never excluded that coverage, you know, just because for like $10 a year is typically what it costs to include terrorism coverage. Cause you know, it's not one of those big risks that, you know, we've ever seen happen, but it, you know, it still exists as a possibility. So I try not to cut any corners and leave stuff out. You know, I'm in this business to make sure I cover every single thing that could possibly happen you know, within the realm of reason, you know, if there's something that's going to be a thousand dollars, obviously I'm going to be like, Hey, do you really want this coverage? If you want it, this is what it's going to do. If you don't want it, this is what could happen. That wouldn't be covered, but something like terrorism coverage, I'm really not even going to ask unless you ask me because for the, the 10 bucks or eight bucks that it costs, it, you know, awesome. unless you tell me to leave it off, you know, I'm going to leave it on there. Um, so if you want to get a hold of Matt, again, you can go down here. 
I've seen the question just come again, pressurewashhelp.com slash insurance. Fill out the form. It'll send it to him. That way he can get it. Um, it just asks your name, phone number, email address, and your state. Um, another thing, Matt, I got, I've had a couple people ask, can you, uh, can you repeat that number in the policy, please? Uh, yeah, the NAICS code, and that's NAICS. If you look it up, it's 561790. All right. So that question has been asked about twice. So <laughs> Yeah, and that's and that 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 specifically covers like an exterior cleaner. Um, you know, cleaning services. It, it, it's kind of a broad scope, but it is specific to your industry in, in addition to a few others, but um, yeah. it specifically covers you guys. And that terrorism, he did write back. He said, you're right. It was only 18 bucks. So yeah, it's, it's usually pretty cheap. Um, need to know about employee coverage, workers comp insurance required for big business, how much to carry and where to get it. So, I mean, workers' comp, essentially what you're doing is with workers' comp is you're providing coverage for an employee's uh, medical bills and lost wages. So if you think of, you know, workers' comp, it's, it's, it's coverage for what it sounds like. You know, it's compensation for your employees. Um, you can include yourself as a business owner or you can exclude yourself as a business owner. Obviously, the cost differences will, you know, reflect that depending on if you include yourself or exclude yourself. Um, but, you know, the important things with workers comp is, you know, how many employees do you have? You know, what are your, um, you know, wages, salaries, everything else? Um, those all come into play when you're looking at workers comp. Um, you know, typically you can find a company. You know, I have several companies that will do the general liability, the commercial auto, and the workers' comp. Um, sometimes you run into situations where one of my favorite companies, uh, they don't actually do workers' comp, but they've got a great general liability and they've got a great commercial auto policy. Um, so I might have to refer, you know, a different company just to handle the workers' comp. Because um, when you get into some states, Kentucky in particular, uh, a lot of companies, they just, it's a, Kentucky's a very highly, you know, litigated. There's a lot of lawsuits and stuff that come out of Kentucky. So, you know, insurance companies tend to steer clear of things where it's a little bit riskier. Um, and then you've got states like Ohio, where you have to get workers comp directly, you know, through the state. Um, but on workers comp, what I would say, in addition to that, uh, there's coverage on there, which is called a stopgap. Um, and that's coverage where if you have workers comp in a state like Kentucky, you would want to have that stopgap coverage in place that would extend if you were doing a job in Ohio, you don't typically do all your work in Ohio, but it, it covers that gap where, you know, you're going to have to go to Ohio and do a couple of jobs or whatever. And if one of your employees is injured there, you have that stopgap coverage in place to cover that. I don't know if that covers the inclusive question of everything on workers comp, but pretty much um, some things on workers comp. You got to remember too, guys is, you know, you really need it for your employees. If you're planning on having employees, you really need it. You by law, you're supposed to have it. Um, if you don't have it, it can, it's not good at that point. They can sue the home. I mean, that person can sue the homeowner. They can sue. And I don't know if this is true or not with, you might be able to, um, I was took a class and it was through the Better Business Bureau and the guy was from the Ohio State um, stuff and he was saying that if that person falls and gets hurt, he can sue the homeowner and it don't fall under the homeowner's insurance because it's the, te it's the same thing as you paying money for it or something. So I don't know if that's true or not. And he was using that as a scare tactic, but either which way, I wouldn't want that to be happening to me, so... So, yeah, if you um, is the question, if you one of your employees, um, you know, slipped at a job site, is yeah. that the question? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it could be nothing that you've done, but, you know, they fell at a job site. Um, that would be where workers comp would come into play because, you know, it's your employee. They're at the job site. 
Now it doesn't cover them if they're, you know, at their house and they, you know, slip and, uh, you know, frying pan falls down and busts them in the head and they need to go to the emergency room or something. Right. Right. <laughs> that's, that's, that's on them and their own, you know, coverage. But if they're on a job site, you know, regardless of if it's, you know, something that you guys did in the course of your work or they just, you know, slip on a porch, um, that's where workers' comp comes into play is it covers their medical uh, payments in addition to any lost wages. If they've got to be out of work, if their doctor says, hey, you can't go back to work for three weeks, workers' comp kicks in and pays, you know, their you know, wages, their average wages, or however you pay them hourly, 40 hours a week or whatever, it pays them for that time that they can't work. So the one William Brown put, um, what are the rules with bring, hiring help in Kentucky worker compensation? Do I need to have, do I need to have it with hiring only one employee? Um, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a legal expert so i can't say that you're you know what you're required to do and what you're not i mean technically you can go do any jobs with employees that you know you don't have workers comp for you know you can have you know help out there that you pay cash under the table um you know the the reason you want workers comp is if you have somebody that's working for you that is a little bit you know savvy and you know, they know if they're hurt on the job that they can come after you um, through workers' comp or whatever. Legally, they're going to have, a you know, a better leg in the fight than what you do because they were injured under your care, under your employment, and you don't have coverage to cover that injury. So, you know, I'm like I said, I'm not a legal expert. You can absolutely have people out there that are, you know, working for you that aren't covered that you don't have a workers comp policy for and you may have some kind of waiver that says you know they're you know on their own in the event of some kind of accident or whatever that might deter them from submitting a claim like that but if it were to go to litigation and go to trial you're probably not going to win that but it may do something to deter them from you know, submitting something against you. We the best way I found out we had workers comp is to deter it real fast and just tell them you're going to drug test them and usually they'll will uh, they, they they become really healthy really quick. So <laughs> just saying. All right, Benjamin Baker gave me a like twenty bucks. Thank you, but he's got a question that's um, can you talk about having a ten ninety nine contractors? How does this work with coverage? We have our listed on our commercial auto policy, but how does it work with the liability insurance? So are you saying if you bring in a contractor to do some other segment of the job that you're doing? Or am I wondering about if, he, if he's driving one of his vehicles? Yeah, so on your commercial auto policy, um, one of the things that I always put on every commercial auto policy is hired and non-owned autos. So, you know, you might have uh, an employee driving their own vehicles or you might have, uh, you know, the need to rent a certain vehicle for a job. Um, it extends your commercial li auto liability coverage over your employees driving their vehicle, over, you know, you or one of your employees driving a vehicle that your business doesn't own. Um, anything like that, you know, on your commercial auto policy, you want to have that hired and non-owned coverage. And, I don't so know that I got that to 1099 specifically. I don't know what that was pertaining to. I think that was just containing to that he had an employee that was 1099. If, oh, okay. if, if he was driving the vehicle, would he still be covered even though he was a 1099 employee? Yeah. Make sure you got that hired and non-owned. Hired um, and non-owned. Okay. Yep. That'll cover you. All right. Um, what's the uh, best company with full coverage for residential and commercial washing? Just You're going to have to figure that out with your own insurance agency, I'm assuming, if you don't go with Matt. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it, it all depends. Um, I'll give you some of my favorites um, that I know coverage-wise, price-wise, 
Um, they do a great job. Um, one of my favorites is Grange. Um, they are, you know, who I would primarily put most of the business in around here. The one caveat to them is they don't do workers' comp in Kentucky, but man, they've got a hell of a product for the general liability and the commercial auto. Um, Hartford has a great product for pressure washers. Uh, Travelers also has a great product. Um, EMC is another one that I've used in the past. It's a EMC insurance group. Um, and then let me see, I wrote down one other. Uh, CNA is another one. They specialize in more of the roofing risk. So if you're like on some roofs that are way, way up there, there are specific companies out there that will do, you know, risks that are specific to roofing. Um, most of the companies I do, you know, will allow you to, you know, do some roofing work. It should be kind of incidental. You shouldn't be on a roof like 90% of the time. Right. Most of the roofs that you hit should be able to be shot at, you know, from the ground or maybe from up to three stories. Um, so, you know, you might be on a second story and need to, you know, shoot up another two or three stories. That's okay. Um, but, you know, those companies in particular, um, Grange, like I said, is probably my go to just because I know the company very well. I know, you know, the underwriters, the claims folks. And I know their product pretty well, but Hartford's good. Travelers is good. Um, EMC's good. When I get to some of these other companies that, you know, say that they cover pressure washers, I get a little bit leery because I know they cover them under a uh, janitor, as a janitor. Um, so, you know, they might say they do, you know, cleaning, cleaning services, but they don't actually have you know, as robust of a product that is going to cover, you know, the exterior cleaning, the driveway, the patios, the, you know, the pool area, the roof, the siding. Um, so a lot of these companies, yeah, they'll give you a policy. Yeah, I mean, you can go out there and get a janitor policy for 500 bucks, 600 bucks. And, you know, you can show that you've got insurance, but at the end of the day, if what you're concerned with is making sure that, you know, your your ass is covered if something happens. You don't want to have just a janitor's policy. <laughs> no, no. And, and that was something else we were talking about beforehand, and we'll go into that a little bit. Uh, when do I, or how do I, um, if I have a claim, what is the normal process, and when should I really just pay it out of pocket versus should I really claim it? You know, because some people have the idea, well, just put everything under the claim. And then that way, you know, it kind of builds. So what when you know, what's the process? What's a normal process to file a claim? And then when should I, you know, should I file it or should I just pay it out of pocket and be done with it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's always in your best interest. If you can work something out with your customer, you know, I'd say 95 plus percent of the time, you know, it might be some window damage or siding um, or, you know, other things like that, that, you know, you're not looking at a major expense. So first off, know what your deductible is. You know, typically 500 bucks, a thousand dollars is what your deductible is going to be on, you know, damage to somebody else's property. So if you're looking at, you know, window damage, you know, a couple hundred bucks. I would tell you to eat that cost all day because first off, if you turn that claim in, you're now going to have a claim against your commercial policy and you're not going to get any money back <laughs> because, you know, the claim is going to be $200, you know, is what it's going to cost. Well, your deductible is 500 bucks. So the insurance company is going to be like, well, sorry, but your deductible is 500 it's only worth 200 bucks. So you're, you got, you got to eat that. So the $500 or the thousand dollar deductible is what you pay out of your pocket. They'll eat up anything over that. So you really want to reserve claims for situations where you're talking, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you know, it really hit the fan and you, you know, you really screwed the pooch here, but you got a 20, $30,000 claim 
and you know it's like massive damage and you know it's going to be bad and you know the client's going to come after you or whatever well then you're going to want to get you know your insurance company involved they're going to send out the adjuster the adjuster is going to look at it and say yeah you know this is on you or the adjuster might also say you guys probably seen this too where something had pre-existing damage and it wasn't really caused by you, but you just putting a little bit of water or a little bit of cleaner on something, you know, just, you know, furthered what other existing damage was there. Well, the adjuster will work in your favor too, to say that, you know, this was pre-existing damage. Like this isn't on, you know, our client, this isn't on the business. You know, the customer had this damage that existed previously. But, you know, to answer the question as far as when you should do it, you know, you you save that for the holy crap moments where, you know, it's it's uh, you, you got no other options. There's nothing you could do to resolve it on your own. But, you know, if you can fix it yourself, whether it's offering some other service or fixing whatever issue it was, do that, you know, every time you can. Because um, what happens on, you know, what happens on claims is whenever you're looking at, you know, your rating and everything else, every company you go to, they want to look at your three-year loss history. So you might have an agent that wants to see your loss runs. You know, they want to see what your experience is. So when you're trying to get, you know, switch companies or, you're, you know, shopping around, you're going to have to demonstrate, you know, your claims activity. So, you know, it's one thing if you had to really use it for that big, holy crap moment, but you don't want to nickel and dime yourself with little stuff. Right. What um, Ben Benjamin asked, um, how many claims have you filed? What is the most common claim filed? Um, I'd say, I mean, thankfully, I think the only claim that that I've seen come across wasn't one that I told the eight or the you know the business to actually pursue filing, and it was um, I think one of the nozzles had come off and went through part of the siding and through a window. And then they had some water that went into the house. Um, but it was, you know, obviously the customer was upset, but it was one of those things where they had a thousand dollar deductible. And, you know, if, if you're in this business, you probably know some contractors and different folks that could come out and take a look at that and help you fix it. What about, you know, after um, expense, what about, I know this is probably, if you're doing roof clean, this is the biggest one that'll get a lot of people is is uh, plant life, killing a lot of plants, stuff like that, landscaping and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Is that going to be covered under most of your in, uh, claims and that kind of stuff? Yeah, so that's where it comes into, you know, you might hear at some point or you might see on your policy, you know, there's property that's in your care, custody and control. So the, the, the triple C's, uh, that's where, you know, the customer has placed their property in your care to do this job. If you damage it, um, you want to make sure that you have that coverage on your policy. So, you know, usually you'll have, you know, maybe, you know, I think most of them that I do, I put at least like $50,000, maybe $100,000 for specific things like, you know, vegetation for trees, for plants, for, you know, lawns, for different stuff like that, where, you know, they might say, well, you ruined my entire flower bed. And, you know, these are, you know, these are worth hundreds and thousands of dollars. And hey, I've seen, I've seen $20,000 worth of landscape go bye bye, get oh, burnt up. So absolutely. <laughs> and that's where you want to make sure, you know, you've got that kind of coverage. And, you know, you've, you've also got that liability coverage that would kick in, too, because you're obviously liable. Right. You're the one that did it. Right. But specifically, the coverage you want to have is that uh, it's, it's, it's care, custody, and control coverage that's on a commercial policy. So that, because I had a, I, well, I mean, I fixed it myself, but uh, we had a truck that leaked bleach on blacktop, and we had to end up redoing all the black, or the we had to put the black stuff back down on it. Um, obviously we didn't go through the insurance, but that's what, that would be covered under that too. I'm assuming. Yep. Um, yep. is there a major difference between commercial and, and or residential policies? I'm assuming whether you're doing that work, I wouldn't think so. Right. 
No, no, I mean, there's not a difference. It's just, you know, the limit that, you know, maybe a commercial account might want you to have liability wise over residential. I mean, you probably have a lot of residential customers that don't even ask if you have insurance coverage, but it's really when you get into those commercial accounts where they want to, you know, have the proof that you have the insurance coverage. Um, Beth is asking, do I get dinged by asking the insurance company to evaluate an issue? Um, I would, I would ask your agent before anything. And that's why it's important to have a good agent that's at least knowledgeable in, um, you know, this specific industry, which is why I said, you know, I don't have to be your agent, but I can answer questions. Um, so if you do have something that comes up, I will give you my best advice and what, you know, I think. Um, but if you have, you know, an agent that you work with, you know, whether it's a friend or family member, um, I would go to them before you actually call the 800 number to talk to the company directly, because what they're typically going to ask you is, well, do you want to open a claim or, you know, what's going on? And, you know, if you want to run the hypotheticals and stuff like that, talk to your agent. Uh, don't call, you know, the company directly, whoever that might be. Um, can you explain, can, can you help explain additional insured add-on that some commercial places ask for? Yeah, so you might have, um, you know, you might have different, entities that have a vested interest in your business where, you know, they, um, I was working on a big apartment complex, I think, where they had, you know, a bank, a construction company, they had, I think it was like 20 different, you know, additional insurers or additional interests that were actively involved in this project. Well, they all wanted to be listed as additional insurers in the event that something happened in the course of your work or something else, where if you did something that impacted, you know, their revenue or whatever, that your insurance would actually, you know, provide any damages that they might have as a result of your work. Gotcha. And this is kind of the question that I was asking about Christmas light installing, but Jerem Jeremaine, Mr. Cruz asked, I own a pressure washing business and a mowing business. Do I need two different policies or can I get away with one general contractor policy? Yeah, and that's a great question. Uh, it comes up a lot. Don't let an agent sell you two different policies because, um, you know, what you can do, just about every company will do this. You can have whichever one is your primary business. So, you know, I mentioned earlier the class code. It's important to make sure you have the right class code. You can always add additional class codes. Um, you know, I think one of them that I did recently, he did some uh, uh, snow plowing, you know, residential driveways and maybe some parking lots and stuff like that. Um, you just need to add that additional class code onto the policy. So if your primary, you know, business is pressure washing, but in the winter time, you know, you want to do some Christmas lights or you want to do some snow plowing or, you know, you do 60 percent of your business's revenue is pressure washing and 40 percent is lawn care. You know, you can add, you know, as many different classes onto that policy. It's just you have to have those listed in order to have that coverage. If you're, you know, for example, let's say you're doing, you have a lawn care business, but you decided I'm going to start doing some pressure washing. Well, you don't ever update your lawn care policy to add on pressure washing. Well, the, the pressure washing isn't obviously covered, you know, if you were doing something that didn't, wasn't in the scope of lawn care, but you can absolutely add multiple you know, classes onto one, you know, base policy, keep the same limits, the same policy. Um, it also saves you a lot of money too. Um, but yeah, don't let, yeah, don't let somebody tell you that you have to take out multiple policies for every kind of business you want to do. Gotcha. Unless uh, you have different business names, you know, then that might be a little bit different. Um, I tend to get water behind the siding, which most people do, no matter how hard I try. Um, do I need to carry mold insurance or does it dry enough to worry about it? 
Um, I've never seen an issue with mold, um, you know, from anybody that I've ever written. I can take a look at that and see. Um, I wouldn't but think so. Put, and I mean, um, for the fact of the, the bleach getting back, there's going to kill the mold in the first place. But even if there is mold, there's probably a problem before. It's probably one of those things that would be a, a issue before you ever got there in the first place. Yeah. Week. Yeah. I mean, what you're going to see with like mold coverage you know, if an adjuster came out there, they're going to look at that and be like, you know, mold didn't just happen from him pressure washing this. It would have had to have been, you know, years or so uh, right. that build up. And to your point, you know, the chemicals and stuff that you guys would use would kill mold more so than it would. And you we're know, not using high pressure. It's not like we're getting up there blasting the crap out of it either. So, right. you know, we're using 80 to 100 PSI pressure. So it's not a lot of pressure. It's more volume than we are pressure. So um, what about um, roof cleaning insurance? Roof cleaning insurance versus not doing roof cleaning. Is that going to help us keep our payment way down at that point? Um, I wouldn't say way down. Um, you know, if you are, you know, cleaning roofs, um, at all, you know, don't be shy about, you know, putting that on there, you know, where it comes into play is if you're, you know, on roofs that are, you know, hotels or you're getting above like five, 10 stories, you know, you're on those kind of roofs doing cleaning. Um, that's a little bit different. That's a different kind of class, but you know, if it's a uh, incidental where you got to get up on an awning to reach, you know, this next level, you're not looking at a significant difference to where I would say, yeah, just don't worry about, you know, don't tell them that you do any roof cleaning. It is a little bit of a difference, but the risk you run by not, you know, identifying that you do some roof cleaning is that if you ever do, or if you ever had to get on a roof and something happens, I go right back to, you know, that holy crap moment I slipped and fell off the roof and, and uh, you know, something happened to an employee or whatever. Uh, you run that risk of not having the coverage there when you need it. Right. Um, what about, um, let's see, I've heard that ladders make your policy go up quick. Is that true? Probably. I wouldn't think so, would it? Uh, what is it? I've heard that ladders make your policy goes up quick. Is that true? No, I no, so. no, I've not heard that. Um, here's a question that came in from me. It says, um, I'm part-time and I cannot find affordable insurance. When I tell them I clean roof and gutters, they will not insure me or it's $3,300 a year for a 1 million general liability. This is my biggest struggle right now. Um, how do I solve this? Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you're just looking for general liability, um, trying to find coverage for it, you know, depending on the state you're in, you know, every state's going to rate a little bit different. I can, I can speak pretty well to the Midwest as far as Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, uh, surrounding states around there. Um, you know, you shouldn't be paying you should be kind of in the ballpark of a thousand dollars to you know fourteen hundred maybe depending on you know how much equipment you have um how long you've been in business is a variable but it's also the amount of experience that you have so you know if you just you know last night had this epiphany that i want to be a pressure washer well, you don't have any background, you don't have any experience in it. So, yeah, I mean, you might be looking at, you know, three, four thousand dollars because who knows what you could get into. You know, you're a lot riskier than somebody that, you know, maybe worked for, you know, Jerry's pressure washing. And now you've gone out on your own after 10 years of working there. You know, you've got 10 years of experience. So, you know, you shouldn't be paying what this guy that just had this, you know, great idea last night, you know, what he had, but it's, you know, $3,300, uh, you know, that's, that's quite a bit for, you know, if you're just talking a base general liability policy. All right. Let's talk a little bit about our auto insurance for our vehicle. Do we need to have commercial on it or can we get 
Um, can we just do residential on it? You know, just our regular old commercial or residential um, policy that we have on it. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, my buddy Ben will tell you what I think about this one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can, you can absolutely, you know, you can try, you can keep it on a personal policy. Um, but what happens is it goes back to that situation where, you know, you're insured as a janitor and something happens. Well, you're not a janitor. Um, you know, think of it as you're driving to a job site or you're, you know, it's two o'clock in the day and you always are working nine o'clock till eight o'clock at night and you're driving your work truck to a job site and something happens, your personal auto policy, you know, that company, you know, you rear in somebody and you cause hundred thousand dollars worth of damages. They can very, very easily within their rights, look at that and say, well, you were driving to a job. This isn't personal use. This is commercial use. And they can deny that claim, gotcha. um, you know, and there's not extensive coverages on a personal auto policy that you have on a commercial policy, you know, where I was talking about like the, you know, the hired, the name, the non-owned auto policy that you can add for, you know, employees driving vehicles. Um, but it's just so extensive on the commercial side. But I'd say the most important thing is if something does happen, you know, somebody can't come after you personally, after your family, after your home, after your livelihood. They've got to go through the business entity itself, you know, that is insured on that commercial policy. So you, you keep yourself separate, you know, from the business in that way. Um, but furthermore, it's you you kind of eliminate the risk of not having coverage, you know, for something that you could have paid a little bit more for. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie, like commercial auto isn't cheaper than personal auto, you know, getting a personal policy, but that's because the coverage you're getting is it's not even comparable. I mean, it's night and day different, you know, the level of coverage you get on a commercial policy. Um, Benjamin Baker asked, um, can you have two policies for liability through two separate companies in case something happens, hypothetically speaking, if you just want to be sure you're covered or are they going to probably fight against each other? Who's going to pay what I would assume, right? Yeah. I mean, I, well, first off, I would never say to do that um, because what's going to happen is, you know, those companies are going to go back and forth and you're never going to get money to take care of the issue that you've got. So, you know, they're going to fight and bicker over who's, you know, responsible for what. And, you know, it might take, you know, years of a court battle for them to figure out, you know, who who owes a specific claim. So you're if, if you're going to do anything, stick with one carrier and maybe just increase your limits. Gotcha. 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 All right, guys. Well, we're at here. Let's see. I think let me see what this other question is. Um all right, guys. So again, thank you, Matt, for coming on. Um, I wanted this is something that I've been trying to find an insurance guy to be able to give me some real questions and answers because this is probably, like I say, this is the biggest question that I get, and now they're going to get this video every time that I get that question. So I appreciate you coming on here again. If you would like to. Um, get a quote or have him check your stuff out, go down here to pressurewashhelp.com slash insurance, and he will be able to do that. Um, Benjamin Baker saying, okay, that's what I was told. Just wanted to be sure I was correctly informed. Um, so again, thank you, Matt, for coming on. Um, on the other side of things, tonight is, or tomorrow night is my last night of Pressure Wash Help of the cheaper membership. Um, so go check out pressurewashhelp.com slash training. And in there, you will find everything you need there. Um, the Voxer program is going away. Um, come tomorrow night. Um, I will be not, I won't be having the Voxer program anymore after to, um, tomorrow night. So if you want to get in that, definitely go check that out. Pressurewashhelp.com slash training. Um, I'm glad you all came out. I hope you all have a good week. Go out there and kill it. Uh, Matt and I both, 
Uh, we appreciate um, everything and coming out here. Any last words for talking about insurance on the way out of here, Matt? No, I would just say, you know, if you guys submit stuff to me, you know, uh, hang with me. I don't have a big, robust staff of people, but I am very diligent. You know, I am very quick to respond to stuff. I can promise you that you'll get a faster response from me than what you'll get from most other people. So, you know, I do see a lot of stuff coming in already. I will get to you guys. Um, you know, I, I'd expect with within 24 hours, you're here, you'll hear something back from me. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. And we'll see you in about two seconds after this shuts off.